thank you for the opportunity to be here today with all of you to talk about digital inclusion issues, particularly in the Philippines and across Southeast Asia. Um, just a, a little bit of background in addition to that long introduction. Recently, my wife and, and myself, we moved here to Los Banos earlier this year, this past January. My wife, Carolyn, is uh, sitting over there looking down. <laughs> so we moved here in January because Carolyn accepted a role at the International Rice Research Institute at Erie. Uh, so we've been here for about 10 months. But I did want to also recognize that even though we've only been here for 10 months, uh, the Garrity's have had a long family history with UPLV and with Circa, and you know, some of you may may know some of the other Garrity's who, who have been here. So I just wanted to, to point out that my mother, Vilma Kaluuya Garrity, uh, graduated from UPLV here in 1971 with a BS in, in agriculture, and it was in August of uh, August 5 of 1972 when my father, Dennis, was traveling through the Philippines after spending a year at the Punjab Agricultural University in India, he met my mother here at Erie in the library. Um, he returned to the US, came back to do his master's research here at UPLB. Uh, they got married, and then we ended up, um, well, then they went back to the US for my, my father's PhD, but then came back here, and this is where actually I was born. We lived in Circa Housing, house number nine, if, you, if you've ever driven past it. And there's a little photo of my dad with my older brother, Abe, and myself um, while, we, while we were here. So there's a, there's, there's a long family history that we've had with UPLB and, and with Circa, and it's been wonderful to be able to return uh, and share a lot of this with Carolyn, who was completely, this is the first time actually moving uh, or visiting the Philippines prior to, uh, to uh, last August. So, uh, in terms of uh, profession, my professional background, I think we went through we went through it quite extensively. Uh, but just to point out that, you know, while I'm not an agricultural scientist like my parents before me, um, having grown up in Southeast Asia, first here in the Philippines, and then we moved to Indonesia when I was about 10, 11 years old, um, the experiences of living in Southeast Asia, and particularly the East Asian economic crises, if you remember that back in 1997, 1998 where we started with, uh, with loan defaults and currency devaluations in Thailand, spread to Korea, um, Indonesia, and a few other countries as well. But that whole experience and seeing the sort of economic policy and the austerity measures that were placed on countries like Indonesia and, and how that led to social unrest and the fall of several governments, that's really what led me to focus on development economics um, in, in my schooling, schooling and then also in my career starting with the World Bank and moving over to, uh, to Cisco. So for today, for the short time that, uh, that we have together, and thank you very much for being here, by the way. I know it's late on a Thursday afternoon, so I want to make this, uh, on a Tuesday afternoon, so I want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to, to interject, uh, particularly if they're on topic. We can, we can cover them midstream. So what I really wanted to focus on today was to talk a little bit about internet connectivity in general and information and communication technologies, and then specifically talk about the application of ICTs to agricultural development in Southeast Asia. So my hope is that after our, our short time together, uh, you'll walk away with maybe a little bit more um, of an of a understanding of how exactly you can use digital tools in the, in the work that you're doing in agricultural development, and perhaps, perhaps selfishly, because I work very much on ecosystem issues, and digital inclusion issues. Perhaps we will surface some ideas on how this particular community, this community here at Circa focusing on agricultural development, can uh, really play a role in supporting digital ecosystem development, right? So basically the underlying infrastructure um, that not only can help in agriculture, but in other sectors as well. So I wanted to start with a question, and this is a question that we cover a lot, or I've covered a lot with my colleagues in USA. And the, the question really is, is around internet connectivity. And if you think about internet connectivity and the work that you're doing in agricultural development, do you see internet connectivity as an enabler, something that helps to amplify the, the work that you're trying to do, or do you see it as a, a prerequisite to getting to the social development outcomes that you all are, are working towards? And the reason why I ask this question is because Working on internet issues in an agency like USA, 
when I would talk to health specialists or agricultural specialists or education specialists, and I would talk about the, the potential impact and, and, and the value of digital tools, the response, the common response was, oh, that's nice, the internet, internet that's, that's interesting, that'd be great if we, could, if we could use it, but really we're focused on more basic issues that we need to, to get to, right? whether it's health outcomes, education outcomes. And so I think <laughs> this is a mindset that, uh, that, that, we've, that I've faced working at USA, and I think it's one um, that is, is useful to think about in the work that you're trying to do. So is internet connectivity an enabler, or is it really a prerequisite to get into the, the social impact outcomes that, uh, that we're all trying to achieve? So one response, right, is, is a, a quote here from uh, the president of the National Fund for Agricultural Development, uh, Gilbert Hongbo, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, where in response to this question of what is the, the, the importance of digital to, to agricultural development and rural development. He remarked, in today's world, when we talk about rural transformation, my best example is that the youngsters need to make sure WhatsApp is working. This is almost non-negotiable. So what, what the president of IFAD is really saying here when he's talking about rural development is that in order to, to encourage youth to really participate in uh, in agriculture and to stay in rural, area, rural areas, they not only need to be able to, to participate in the digital economy more generally, and WhatsApp is a messaging platform like Viber or Facebook Messenger, but also be able to use digital tools. And so he goes into to talking a little bit uh, about, about some of those issues. So if you, if you, if you look at what, what he's saying here, I mean, he, he's really seeing digital tools and the digital ecosystem as more of a prerequisite to agricultural development. So before jumping into um, into the rest of the content, I, I wanted to just maybe talk about some definitions, right? So I think uh, a lot of people use these terms um, very very frequently, and you're all probably very familiar with it. But information communication technologies, this is essentially an expansion on information technology. Information technology being really about computing power, uh, and then ICTs, you're adding in the communications components particularly through, through digital mediums such as the internet, telephone, telephony, um, and then also other communications technologies. I mean, people forget that even radio is considered to be a, an ICT, and particularly in, agric in agriculture, it, it is a, an effective medium to reach farmers. And then digital technologies. Digital technologies, this is uh, the way that uh, the World Bank has defined digital technologies, really around the internet, mobile phones, and other tools used to collect, store, analyze, and share information digitally. So when we think about ICTs and the global response to, to uh, ensuring that uh, all people can really benefit from ICTs, I'd like to go back to the early 80s when the UNITU, the Telecommunications Body of the United Nations, really put forth a, a call to action around the uh, universal access to basic ICTs. And this is a report that was put out in 1984, commonly known as the Maitland Report. And if you read this quote, there's a, there's a double negative, so we'll read it slowly. There is no good reason why by the early part of the next century, so the early 2000s, virtually the whole of mankind should not be within easy reach of a telephone and all of the benefits that this could bring. Now this was back in 1984 and in the early 80s, and you can see that uh, this is even before the advent, really, in the adoption of mobile telephony. So in the cover of the, of the report, you're seeing basic fixed telephones. So if you think about that early goal, and you take a look at where or what, what happened uh, in this time, essentially, this, this is a chart. You can't really see uh, the, the dates. But we're starting in 1960 over here, all the way through to 2014. And you see that fixed telephony, fixed telephones, landline phones, as a percentage of, global, of the global population, essentially really peaked at around 18 or 19 percent of the global population around 2006 or so. And then there was a, a decline, and that decline, of course, is because of, of the um, adoption of mobile telephony. But the point to make here is that even when you think about fixed telephony, um, universal adoption or universal access really was never achieved. Uh, and even though you do get to about 19% of the global population having uh, uh, access or, or subscription to a fixed telephone line, really that's, that number is, uh, is, is not 
um, geographically uh, of equal weight in different parts of the world, and then also it double counts in many cases with, with telephones at uh, businesses and, and uh, outside of the home. On mobile telephony, the story is very different, right? And so mobile telephony, if you see uh, essentially where the, the hockey stick starts to, or the curve starts to really accelerate is around the year 2000, 2002. And looking at this chart, essentially you see mobile telephone subscription as a percentage of the global population, you get to about 100%. Now this is a common statistic that gets thrown around and even places like the Philippines you hear a mobile, percent, you, you hear a mobile subscription rate of over 100%. The problem with this, this data, of course, is that it, it obfuscates the fact that, um, that there are many subscribers that have multiple phones, uh, there's many subscribers that are actually just using SIM cards for other purposes, like Internet of thing, Things applications. And so the real metric that we'll take a look at later is really around unique mobile subscribers. How many people really have a, have a telephone, and we'll, we'll get to that. But starting with the early goals around informa information and communication technology, the global community has adopted new targets, right? And so if you take a look at the Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly SDG 9C, it's really focused on internet connectivity. And SDG 9C reads uh, to significantly increase access to ICT and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developed countries by 2020. Now, when this was written in 2015, 2016, it was a very aggressive goal. And you know, spoiler alert: we're only two years away from uh, 2020, and global uh, internet uh, adoption is still less than 50 percent. So this is this is one of those aspiration targets that we will not get to. But despite, uh, despite some of the, the room to grow um, still with regard to digital technologies, I think it's really important to take a look at why digital technologies are, uh, are a medium for service delivery. And so if you take a look at this chart, essentially what you're looking at in the red line is the uh, adoption rate of mobile phones. Um, and then if you look at some of the, the lines above, so the first line is improved water or access to, to water, uh, electricity, secondary school, uh, and sanitation. And so, not just in agriculture, but in other elements of, of so, in other dimensions of social development, you can really see uh, how mobile telephony and digital tools can play a role in improving service delivery. If you think about things like um, education. Um, I also wanted to just cover a little bit about the the impacts of connectivity um, and uh, some of the, the, the literature on, um, on internet access. And so, you know, I think we all take it for granted that uh, telephony and, and digital tools can really, um, really play a role in our, in our lives, but uh, the research is there as well. So at the macroeconomic level and at the microeconomic level. And so what we're taking a look at here is really the impact of different ICTs, different communication technologies, um, on country groupings and the impact on the, the, the increase in annual GDP growth from a 10% increase in penetration of these different technologies, right? And so if you start uh, in the, the, the left side, we're starting with basic fixed telephones, landline phones, moving all the way up to broadband penetration. And the two things to really, uh, or the three things to really take from this, this particular chart is one, you know, this is a robust analysis that, that was done by the World Bank in 2009. Uh, it, was, it was done again in 2013. But it, it demonstrates at a macroeconomic level the impact of ICTs on, on countries' uh, development and countries' economic growth. Two, what you're seeing is that as you go from more basic ICTs, fixed landline telephones, all the way up to internet usage and then high speed, high data throughput, uh, broadband, you're seeing that the impact is higher from more complex digital technologies. And, and the third thing to take away is that in the black, you're, this is a country grouping of advanced economies. In the red, it's country groupings of, of developing economies. And so the interesting finding from this particular analysis is that the impact on developing countries is even higher than it is on uh, advanced economies. Uh, won't go into into uh, the, the channels on how ICTs contribute to economic growth, but essentially uh, it, it has to do a lot with total, total factor productivity growth, 
um, and increasing uh, labor productivity because of, of capital deepening. This is an easier way, I think, or a, a more direct way to, to think about the, the main mechanisms of how digital technologies impact development, right? And this is work that was done from the World Bank in the 2016 World Development Report, uh, really around um, in, in improving search and, and information access, right? Uh, around automation and coordination and uh, scale economies. So that's at a, at a macroeconomic level. At the micro level, there's a lot of work that, that has also been done to really demonstrate how access to basic technologies improves livelihoods. Uh, if you're looking at uh, you know, some of this work here is on, on rising income levels among the very poor um, in East Africa at a village level. There's a lot of work that's been, been done on market expansion. So some of the, the early work was around how do you use mobile phones? So how can fishermen, for example, use mobile phones to really decrease transaction costs of identifying which markets to, to bring their products to. And this was work that was done in Kerala and in India back in the late 1990s. Uh, and then also how do you um, essentially uh, identify, identify what markets to take brand products to. So a lot of this is, is embedded in the digital tools that you're seeing today around agriculture, uh, uh, bringing agricultural products to market. Uh, jumping in is specifically to digital tools in agriculture, right? And I think um, there's there, there's a number of different channels by which digital tools can really uh, improve agricultural development. And so this is just a a, a number of of examples around revolutionizing farmer organizations, uh, really encouraging farmers to interact with each other around best practices, um, empowering rural women and youth. <laughs> Lowering the barriers, distance to markets, uh, re re revamping extension models, uh, and then improving feedback loops. And we'll talk about some of the specific tools that uh, that that demonstrate some of these these impacts. One of the things I did want to share at a at a micro level too is the fact that there are still uh, a lot of areas where where there is very little connectivity. And uh, one of the the interesting um, Efforts that, that we've supported uh, essentially is with colleagues of yours, if, if you're here at University of the Philippines, but colleagues of yours at UP de la Man, where essentially there are a, there are a number of, of uh, barangays in the Philippines that have no access to even basic tele, tele like 2G access. And so what uh, what the, this group at, at UP de Laval is doing with other partners such as uh, UC Berkeley and other places is they're actually they're actually extending connectivity out to remote fishing villages off the coast uh, uh, of uh, Aurora and uh, what's very exciting about this particular effort is that it's the first that we know of the first randomized control trial of what happens when you when you extend basic 2G services or basic communication services out to communities and so this RCT is pairing villages uh, that are getting access to, to 2G services uh, to, to others that are not and then basically measuring the uh, socioeconomic impacts of, of, two, of basic connectivity. There's a lot of other interesting things happening here we can go into the details but the equipment that they're that they're using is, is open source hardware and software that uh, could really revolutionize the telecommunications industry. Now when you think about constraints to digital tool adoption, right, there's a number of, uh, of issues to really consider, uh, particularly as you go to market or you go to communities with these, these tools. And so I wanted to cover a couple of, of these constraints. And the first is really access uh, and adoption of digital technologies. And so what you're looking at here is a chart of unique mobile subscribers as a percentage of the population. So this gets to more of a, uh, a true picture of how many people in a particular geography have, actually have a mobile phone. Uh, and so if you take a look, the world, uh, the, the number for the world is around 67, 68, and then 68% of the population are actually mobile subscribers. Uh, and you, know, you go from a high of around uh, 85 or so all the way in, in Europe and North America, all the way down to Sub-Saharan Africa where the number is more around uh, 43, 44 or so. And if you look at countries in the region, 
you can see the Philippines in red here is at 63%. So this is the percentage of the population in the Philippines that have a, at least a basic mobile phone. Uh, and you see some comparisons with other countries in the region from Myanmar at 49% up to Malaysia at 79%. And you know, the number for Myanmar actually is really interesting because that's a market that just has really opened up just in the last few years when it comes to telecommunications uh, services and that number is already at 50%. So one big constraint around digital tools, the digital tool adoption and, and the, the dissemination of digital tools, if this is something that you're working on, is really access. These are your target beneficiaries and the population that you're trying to reach. Are they, are they, do they actually have mobile phones? Another big constraint is the big gap uh, between urban and rural uh, and the, the big differences in terms of adoption between urban and rural. And so what you're taking a look at here is essentially on the right hand side is a depiction of um, urban populations and GSM coverage. And GSM is just basic 2G telephony. So that's on the right hand side. On the left hand side you see uh, rural coverage. And so rural coverage around 60% uh, for basic 2G services versus urban populations that are more around 88%. But another interesting thing to point out here is that, is that coverage and access to mobile telephony is greater than actual access to, to other uh, basic services such as water access and electricity. Another constraint to digital tool adoption uh, globally is the fact that when you talk now about internet use, right, before we're talking about basic 2G services uh, and, and uh, basic telephony adoption. But when you talk and you think about internet usage, so higher data throughput, these are the apps uh, and the services that ride over data. What we see, at least at a global level, is that internet user growth is slow. And this is actually, this is actually uh, older data and the numbers have, have, have slowed down even uh, since I put this particular chart together. But essentially what you see in the, the bar charts, in the blue, that's the total number of internet users worldwide. Right? And so that's, that's the, the left hand side of this chart. You can see the increase uh, and 2016 was uh, forecasted to be around 3.5 billion or so. Uh, and that number maintains around that level. In the red, the red line is the, uh, the growth rate, the annual growth rate. And uh, essentially the, the growth rate of internet user, users has been slowing over time. Uh, part of it is the law of large numbers because you have a higher base, but part of it too is the fact that a lot of the easier to reach populations already have access to the internet uh, and it's, it's more difficult to connect to the remaining 3.5 million. Another constraint to digital tool adoption is really around limited network availability and affordability. And so what you're looking at here, essentially in the blue, is a, de is a graphical depiction of the 4.2 billion non-internet users globally, and that's segmented between two main groups. The first main group is really around, uh, really around individuals who are covered by 3G access. Right, so 3G being data access. So that's 2.6 billion people worldwide who are within the footprint of 3G telephony, uh, but they're not participating in the, in the digital economy. And then you have another uh, group, 1.6 billion people who are not even within the footprint of 3G access. And so the constraints here are, are different. For the 2.6 billion people covered by 3G but are not subscribers, uh, uh, one of the biggest constraints there is around the costs of service, around the cost of hardware, around the costs of, of, uh, of participating uh, online. Uh, and then the other group is really, 1.6 is really around the fact that you have limited mobile uh, network coverage in, uh, in a, lot of, a lot of the world. So when we think about how to assess a, a national digital ecosystem, there are a lot of tools out there that, that have been produced by the global community. The ITU, the United Nations, have put together an ICT development index. Uh, the World Economic Forum puts together a network readiness index that, uh, that we've participated in. And then also 
with the Broadband Commission, there are, there are a number of different uh, tools, like this Planning for Progress report that, uh, that we put out a few years ago. What I wanted to do to talk about the situation uh, in the Philippines was to use the Inclusive Internet Index, which is produced by the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, with Facebook, because it has some of the most timely, timely data that I think uh, helps to depict the situation in the Philippines very clearly. So if you look at how the Philippines measures within the Inclusive Internet Index, you know, the Philippines places about 54th out of uh, about, 100, about 86 countries overall. And so um, it's, it's in the lower half of the standings for Asia. It's ninth out of 23 lower middle income countries. Um, and if you look at really where the, the sort of strengths and the weaknesses are in the, the digital ecosystem here in the Philippines, you see that in red, the Philippines ranks quite poorly when it comes to affordability, affordability of service, affordability of, of devices, um, and then also in the competitive environment. Right? So the competitive environment includes the fact that, uh, that the telco market really is dominated by two big players um, here in the Philippines. On the, on the strength side, on the strength side you see the Philippines ranking 38 uh, out of 86 when it comes to literacy and digital literacy skills, uh, and then also uh, on in trust and safety. And trust and safety, we'll dive into that, but it really has to do with um, the, the confidence that people have in participating online. And you see that in the Philippines being one of the, the leaders in terms of a social media use um, by, by the population. So really, the, the, the challenges when it comes to the digital ecosystem in the Philippines tend to be on the supply side. It tends, to be, it tends to be on the infrastructure, it tends to be on the, the extension of, of networks. Uh, and it's, what, what you're looking at here in the, the chart uh, really is a graphical depiction of the, the quality of cell service in the Philippines. And I'm sure this isn't a surprise uh, to many of you, right? Because you can go out, uh, even, even here on the side of Mount McKeeling sometimes, you know, it's really poor, poor service. But you go out into rural areas, uh, and there's very little or no signal when it comes to basic 2G. And so, you know, if you look at the, uh, the number of brown guys that don't have any cellular coverage, uh, some estimates point to about a quarter, or close to a quarter of brown guys don't have cellular service. Uh, and then you know, a lot of that also stems from the fact that there are other infrastructure challenges related to, uh, to those brown guys around uh, grid power uh, and being quite geographically isolated. Uh, going into the, uh, the other supply side challenges around competition and affordability, this just drills down a little bit deeper into the, the data from the, the Inclusive Internet Index around uh, wireless operators market concentration. Over here on the left, ranking 66 out of 86 countries. That has to do with the, the essential, uh, essentially the duopoly that we see in the Philippines between the uh, smart. Uh, and then also price. price of services in the Philippines ranking 51st out of 86 countries. Uh, you take a look at some of the rankings around smartphone costs on handsets, uh, mobile phone costs on, on tariffs, both prepaid, postpaid, and then also the cost of a fixed uh, monthly broadband subscription. So this all leads to limited subscriber base, and this is data that uh, was put out by the Asia Foundation a couple of weeks ago around uh, the limited subscriber base with only 45% uh, of the population, uh, or 45% of the population having no internet access, 61% of, of households uh, having no internet access, and 74% uh, of public schools having no internet access. And that's really quite a, a significant number uh, when we think about the importance of, of communications technologies and access to information in an educational context. Uh, what I did want to point out, though, was uh, the sort of demand side strengths, and I think this is this is something to consider when you're thinking about digital tools, the development of digital tools, the, the delivery of digital tools, really around um, the the uh, the strengths on uh, the ability to to utilize uh, these tools, familiarity by by the population, the, the trust that people have in participating online, whether it is government offices or with NGOs. Uh, so that's something to think about there. So what, what this means is that the, 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 the government of the Philippines is really focused on a supply side approach 
to, uh, to supporting digital ecosystem development in the Philippines. And so if you, uh, if you take a look at elements of the, the Department of ICT's uh, National Broadband Plan, you know, they're really focused on the expansion uh, of, of uh, internet infrastructure um, in the country. And so there's a, a number of interesting things that are happening around uh, increased capacity, uh, more national fiber backbone, uh, a new telco that is uh, going to be announced shortly. I think today was the today was the last day. Tomorrow is the last day for for some new bid for for the new telco, uh, and then contribute to all around guys and satellite uh, overlay. So uh, just to, to touch a little bit on on. Uh, the role of ICTs in agriculture. I know a lot of you in the room are, are working on this particular topic. I mean, you know, we, I put up the definition early on in the presentation around ICTs, but I think there's a lot of different a lot of different ICTs to think about when you when you're thinking about how do you reach farmers, work with farmers, uh, work with agricultural extension agents, and so you know this this is just a a, a sampling uh, of different ICTs that are out there and. If you think about the different groupings of, of digital agriculture endeavors, and you can really uh, segment around sort of knowledge repositories, e-learning, intelligent agriculture, you just, you just go around and, and uh, really, really see the different ways to engage uh, using digital tools. One of the, the ways that, that we've thought about um, where digital plays a role in the agricultural value chain is basically by taking a look at uh, where and why it makes sense, it can make sense to to try and digitize the, the agricultural value chain. So this is this is uh, some work that was originally done by my colleagues uh, within the digital development for See the Future, the D2F2F program at USA, really trying to articulate okay from planning through the inputs to, to on-farm production uh, to post-harvest to access to markets. Where exactly can digital tools play a role in, uh, in supporting the, the agricultural value chain? And the sort of different types of tools, right, from data collection, transactions, information exchange, uh, risk management, uh, et cetera. So uh, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time maybe sharing with you a few different examples of digital tools. Uh, from colleagues uh, here in the in the area, uh, this if you take a look at uh, so there's, there's there's different types of tools, right? There's information support tools, there's decision support tools, and there's sort of uh, full suite of service tools. And so Rice Knowledge Bank is one example uh, of an information uh, support tool that that's produced by area that has a, a range of uh, different resources around rice production. Uh, there's de decision support tools. Right, so rice crop manager, rice doctor, and my colleagues at here uh, can, can go into this in, in much more depth. And then there's examples of ICTs for integrated services. So info ladies in Bangladesh uh, around uh, basically working with young women to, to reach remote villages uh, with uh, pro the provision of health, agriculture, and, and IT services. Uh, and then there's others such as Grameen um, and Farmerlink. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about considerations when it comes to the development of digital tools in agriculture. And I think uh, one of the things that we have seen a lot at um, I've seen a lot at, at, at USA is that we get we get pitched a lot of really great ideas, uh, a lot of really great apps or a lot of really great services that are are trying to solve a problem, but they uh, have other issues um, that have not necessarily been thought through. You know, so, so there's, of course, there's content, but then there's also capacity of the users if you're trying to actually reach a particular target group. Is there the capacity there to absorb that information? Do they actually have the tools to, to be able to, uh, to access the information, whether it's you know, on a, a, a data-driven um, application that requires 3G service? Do they have the, the 3G handset? Do they have the service? Be able to, to access that information, and then of course sustainability, right? So cost and cost recovery. We see this a lot where people develop really interesting apps and tools, and they seem to be developed for a a, uh, 
a subsidized, a perpetually subsidized donor environment as opposed to really building in a cost recovery plan, right? Is, is it user fees? Is it an ad supported model? Is there something else that, that can really drive the sustainability um, and scale of the, of the tool itself? And then connectivity. So connectivity is a big one that I focus uh, a lot of time on. Um, and then also wanted to share with you, particularly if you're creating uh, digital tools, I know there's some computer science uh, students there right here who are, who are creating digital tools. And one of the things that was uh, put together by the um, by the by the development community, really driven by foundations such as uh, the, the Gates Foundation and the donor community, uh, bilateral donors, and multilateral donors, is, is the, these principles for digital development. And I think the reason, the real impetus for putting together a, a robust set of principles when you're trying to create digital tools is because of some of the challenges that we've seen around the proliferation of applications and services that then just uh, peter out. Uh, or in, in worst case scenarios, you know, there was an example uh, of, um, of the government of Uganda in, uh, in 2012, 2013, basically, um, basically suffering from pilotitis of digital tool development. Right? Basically saying, no more digital tools, uh, no more digital services, we need to figure out we need to figure out everything that's going on here. And so, uh, so these principles for digital development were really designed to ensure that as, as whomever is developing uh, digital tools within the international development context really takes into account uh, these principles so that we can really see robust dissemination and uptake of these tools. And so, you know, there's a lot of content if you double click into each one of these principles, but essentially, you know, these are very common sense things. Um, but if if the goal that you have as a as a app developer is to uh, really try and reach scale or or uh, obtain funding or adoption, I think these are uh, these are principles to to really take into account with uh, the tools that you guys are, are developing. Uh, so I wanted to point you guys to my wife, Carolyn Florida, who's right there, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, we, it's interesting, Carolyn and I met um, at the World Bank in 2000, 2005, um, 2006, 2006. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we both work on this topic, right? We both work on digital development. We are sort of two sides of the, of the same coin, though, where I focus very much more on the policy level, uh, and focus on internet connectivity issues. Carolyn, in our household, is really the true expert when it comes to actual digital tool development. And so her role uh, at URI is really uh, to, to drive digital tool development in the, uh, in the, in the rice sector and for the, the organization. So definitely reach out to Carolyn if you guys want to talk more about the tools that you guys are creating. Um, and then, I know that we're, we're getting close to, to five o'clock and I want to make sure to, to have a back and forth and, and uh, engage with you on questions, but I wanted to just highlight a couple of other things with regard, with regard to the digital economy with the goal of really still trying to bring you guys into the conversation around uh, supporting digital ecosystem development here in the Philippines, right? One of the things that um, that is a bit concerning with digital tools and internet adoption uh, is the fact that um, what we're seeing with regard to income inequality is that is that in uh, in in terms of global income inequality so basically between countries we've seen a, a decline in global income inequality and so this really has to do with the fact that you see large uh, swaths of the population in China and India really really grow so the income inequality between countries is actually um, on decline However, what we, we do observe is that within countries, and this is across the board in developed economies and in developing countries, within countries, we are witnessing an increase uh, over the last few decades in income inequality within countries. And what's driving this? I mean, a, a lot of the research really points to uh, techno technology and technology adoption. And I think even um, uh, anecdotally, see this uh, in, in the communities that we're operating in. Uh, what tends to happen with, with technology is that it is a, it is a multiplier right, of whatever it is you're trying to, 
could do and achieve and else be on the, on the on malicious side. But that is, is really what's driving the, uh, in, the increase in income inequality within countries where you have populations that are really able to participate in, um, in, in production, in, uh, in, 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 in an economy because of the digital tools that they, they've adopted. And then you, you see populations who are not uh, participating uh, because of a lack of Tools really sort of fall behind. So that's that's something that um, is is really top of mind to to folks in the, the international community with regard to, to internet access is the fact that we still see income inequality increasing within countries. And there are there are there are many downsides uh, to digital technologies and the, the unchecked adoption of digital technologies. And I, I think you know, that's really coming to the forefront these last few years, at least with how digital tools are being utilized in our, our political discourse um, back in, in the United States as an example. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a chart also from the World Bank Development Report 2016 that really points out the, the risks associated uh, with the pervasive spread of digital technologies. That uh, you can spread information without, without accountability, and so you think about the ability for um, for uh, political groups to, to use digital technologies to exert more control over their constituencies. Um, we talked a little bit about inequality and, and um, uh, income inequality, but also with the, the spread of digital tools, particularly around automation, uh, there is a, a potential for a hollowing out of the, of the labor force where you have um, low skilled, highly repetitive, Skills and, high, and positions that are highly repetitive being basically uh, substituted with, uh, with, with robotics or even with machine learning. Um, and you see some of that threat to even things like the BPO industry here in the Philippines, right? The call center uh, industry. Uh, and then uh, concentration of wealth. And this is something we're really seeing with the, uh, the, big, the big tech companies, particularly in the US, but the, the ability to um, to concentrate uh, resources, particularly when you have um, natural monopolies like, like some uh, digital technologies tend to be, because there's very, very zero, there's a very low cost of, of marginal cost for, um, for of, of production once you once you have the initial uh, product out there. So these are the downsides, and I just wanted to also highlight um, the sort of the policy or analog complements that the World Bank also highlights, right? And so I think this is important to recognize uh, our, that because of the, the speed and the acceleration that digital tools allow you to, to go to market with and, and, and conduct activity, that these analog complements are, are all the more important. Uh, so this is really around regulatory policy, uh, an environment that really is protecting consumers, consumer protection policies, uh, skills development, and this is a huge one. Um, you know, workers, entrepreneurs, and, and, and making sure public servants all have the right skills, and then strong institutions, institutions that can check some of the, the new winners uh, in, in the digital economies uh, that we're seeing. Um, so, so that's uh, analog compliments. And so, I, you know, in um, in in closing, I, I just wanted to return to to this question. And I know uh, thirty minutes isn't isn't a, a lot of time to really try and answer this, this particular question, but uh, I, I hope that um, you know some of the, these points and these slides give you a little bit of pause to think about, okay, what really is the, the role of internet connectivity? Is it, is it just this, something that's nice to have once everything else is fulfilled, or is it really something that we need to, to focus on um, as, a, as a community, particularly when it comes to agricultural development? And I think the last point that I'll make uh, for, for this particular audience is that you know, if you're focusing on, on agricultural development, you tend to focus with the Department of Ag, or Ministries of, of Agriculture. But I think it's important to make sure that, that, uh, that when it comes to supporting the development of an infrastructure layer that then feeds back into the work that you're trying to do around agriculture, that you engage with other parts uh, and other, other peers. And so, you know, this is a, this is a, 
a graphic that uh, comes from the, the FAO e agriculture strategy. And what I think is really important, what, what's really interesting about this is that it, it particularly um, articulates that you know, for national e agricultural strategy, it's not just the ministries or the departments of ag that, uh, that play a role here, but it's really working with the ministries of communication, right, or ministries of, of IT. And so that's, that's the sort of call to action that I would, I would encourage you all to, to think about. I know um, there's been at least one or two times when Carol has, has come home from a meeting with, uh, with, with peers at uh, the, the uh, Department of, of Ag, um, and they've, they've remarked that you know, there's very poor cellular connectivity in some of the areas where they're working. And so that's, that's something to, to get the Department of Ag folks talking to the DICT uh, to, to say, hey, we really need your help. Uh, on building out the digital ecosystems in these areas. So with that, I will end uh, with, uh, with this slide again, the long family history with UPLB and Circa. You know, we, we, uh, we hope that, uh, that we're here and we can engage with you all here at Circa for a long time coming. And I uh, just wanted to share that there is a new chapter in the Garrity family story with Circa, and his name is Bayan Garrity. And he was, uh, he was born in June of this year, so there's, there's one more Gary to, to participate at uh, Circa events in the future. <laughs> so this is my uh, email address uh, and contact information, and happy to, uh, to take questions now and engage further. Thank you.